My question is, am I audible to you to start the session? I'm asking you if I'm audible to you. Yes, thank you very much. So we're beginning the session right away. And this is the format that we have to start. So please bear with me for just one minute. On your screen, what you're watching right now are the features of PLUS. The whole purpose of the YouTube sessions and free sessions is to help an academy reach out to more students to give a hint of how a good class can be to all the students so that they can actually join PLUS features. You can learn line from the comfort of your home. You can have unlimited access to all the courses. Every subject can be dealt by more than one teacher and you will be having answers and you'll be having subject data from many people. So right now, this is about an Academy Plus features. You can subscribe to it at this point. The subscription can actually have my name in it. Here, this will be the rates for subscription. One month, three months, six months, 12 months and 24 months. As you increase the number of months that you're going for subscription, you can have a lot of discounts also. And if you want to subscribe, you can use my code, referral code that is shown on the red here. It is Meenakshi Sundaram AS without any kind of spaces and all small letters. So you can use this subscription code go moving forward. Thank you for listening to this. So now we are going for the first MCQ of the day. And this will be the only MCQ of the day. Why? Because this MCQ by itself will have a lot of concepts to be dealt with. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. Have a look at this question. Take your time to understand this question. Among the following, which one belongs to the family of proteins that has been suggested to play an important role in the innate antiviral immunity? So this portion where you read the statement is referred to as the stem and all the A, B, C, D are referred to as the responses. So you have to choose one among the response. Now, the point of concern here is neat exams are becoming more and more tougher. It was not like how it was four years back when it started. So every question can have intrinsic ramifications for you to deal with. So you have to know certain things before you answer certain questions. Now, dissect the question into many parts. Here we speak about proteins, right? So you have to have some basic knowledge in biochemistry to answer this question. Then we speak about antiviral, right? So you have to have basic knowledge in viruses and also in case of microbiology. And I said immunity, right? It means you have to have some amount of knowledge in immunology also. Now, if I bring out a therapeutic intervention for antiviral activity, then that will become a part of pharmacology also. So this is called as multi-pronged approach to a single question. Now, can you answer a few questions of mine? Have you heard of APO E Epsilon 2 anywhere? APO E Epsilon 2. Have you come across APO E Epsilon 2? If you think you will never be able to answer such questions, do not lose your heart. The sessions are here to expose you to the toughest of questions and then breaking the toughest of questions into simple logic so that your confidence is boosted so that you can face any kind of other tough questions in the future. Excellent. So mad for aims has given me the right answer. The first answer has come forward. This is APO E2. This APO E's Epsilon 2 can be related to Alzheimer's disease. So now first we start the explanation session. See the explanations are given here also, but I will use a written format to help you understand what it is. Okay. APO lipoproteins. Here, I'm going to spend five minutes on biochemistry. Then I'll spend some amount of time on the microbiology and the immunology part. At the end, you should be able to conglomerate all these data to give out the right answer. What is an apolipoprotein? An apoprotein means the protein component in a lipoprotein. Okay, I'll use a brush here. 
you come across the words called as lipoproteins. Mark my words, to answer this question, you have to know all these data. You have to have the concepts beginning from this area. A lipoprotein is an example of a compound protein. What is the meaning of a compound protein? The compound protein means the protein is not homogeneous. It contains a proteinaceous part along with a non-proteinaceous part. And what is the non-proteinaceous part in a lipoprotein? The lipid itself is the non-proteinaceous part. So, we have to convert the lipid, a hydrophobic compound, into something who can actually have similarity with the hydrophilic area. So, you are trying to add the protein. Now, this protein is the apoprotein part. This protein is the apoprotein part. So, simple words. When I use the word lipoproteins, it's a compound protein. Why it is a compound protein? Because it has protein part plus the non-protein part called as lipid. And what is the property of lipid? Lipids are hydrophobic. What is the property of proteins? Proteins are generally hydrophilic. So, imagine this. If this is the lipid with meshwork here, and if there is a protein present here, the protein can easily hide the lipid inside and can help in the transport of the hydrophobic compound called as lipid in 90% water containing part called as blood. So if you want to transport lipid in blood, you have to remember blood is technically hydrophilic. So if you want to transport such a kind of lipid which is hydrophobic in the blood, you are covering it almost 90% with the help of the protein part. So protein parts is actually the apoprotein. This is what is our concern. I am erasing what I have written here. We are going to the next level of understanding what I spoke. So the apoproteins are of five types, most importantly. It can be A, it can be B, it can be C, it can be D, it can be E. The other smaller ones are F, G and H. Now we are focusing on multiple things. Remember, apo E has multiple functions. Apo E is the most important lipid transferring apoprotein, especially cholesterol transporting apoprotein in your brain. So this will give you a hint why when there is a polymorphism or abnormality of the morphology in case of Apo E, especially Epsilon 2, you can have Alzheimer's disease. The most important lipid transferring apoprotein would be apo e so when you have polymorphism in apo e you can expect the brain to be actually disordered in forms of alzheimer's disease where absolute folding and misfolding of proteins can happen when the lipid component is not there protein components can become excess misfolding of proteins happen beta amyloid plaques can increase in your brain which is assuming as a top protein area which can cause alzheimer's disease which is non-senile dementia. Also remember, apo E2 mutation can lead to atherosclerosis. Also remember, apo E has a role to play in coagulation also. This is about apo E. The first thing I asked you about apo E was this. Why did I ask you this? In this question, the one apoprotein that can actually come to your mind easily would be apo E2, right? That's why I am starting with apo E. Now look at apo A, where you see V here, right? This is not V, it is apo A5. This apo A is also important for transfer of LDL, VLDL, HDL, etc. Now, here also you are dealing with the metabolism of lipoproteins. We are speaking about metabolism of lipoproteins. So, the first function of apoproteins is to help in the transfer of lipid. The second function is metabolism of lipoprotein. You can ask me, what is the metabolism of lipoprotein? Remember, HDL has some amount of apoE. It also has some amount of aposi. It has apoA also. By offering some kind of apoproteins, to another kind of lipid, I can go for LDL formation, VLDL formation also. By accepting some extra cholesterol, it can also become HDL. What is HDL? It is referred to as good cholesterol. What is LDL? It is referred to as 
bad cholesterol. So, what is actually HDL, LDL, etc.? It's a combination of lipids called as triglycerides, cholesterol, free fatty acid, and esterified cholesterol also. All these are lipids. Now, you can bring in other proteins. When the lipids have different proportions of each, when the proteins have different proportions of each, the density varies. HDL means highest density. That would mean to say that the protein content is the maximum in HDL. At the same time, phospholipids are also high in case of HDL. But LDL is a rich source of cholesterol. Cholesterol is maximum in LDL. VLDL is rich in triglyceride. But who is the richest in case of triglyceride? Chylomicron. All these will matter to answer this question. Are you with me? Please put up thumbs up if you are with me. And if you want me to repeat something, please let me know. I'll do it. Okay, so the point of concern is, first we are dealing with the metabolism of lipoproteins and we are speaking about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Okay, why is HDL good cholesterol? It pulls the cholesterol from the extra hepatic tissues and takes it to liver. What is LDL cholesterol? It takes the cholesterol from the hepatic tissues to the extra hepatic tissues. For example, the cholesterol goes and binds in the walls of blood vessels, which is extra hepatic. You can go for atherosclerosis. So that function is important for HDL and LDL. So ultimately, what is the concept of metabolism of lipoproteins? It is just the exchange of components. One can exchange the other. If I offer more cholesterol to HDL, HDL will offer the cholesterol to liver. If I offer more cholesterol to the LDL, LDL will offer the cholesterol to the tissues. So you will continuously have exchange of lipids and cholesterol between the compounds. So that exchange is the basis of metabolism of lipoproteins and that is the basis of the apoproteins being used. Now I'll come to another topic called as Apo, watch very carefully, Apo B, EC3G. This is a very special form of Apo protein B. The Apo protein B, as you know, can have two types called as B100, B48, which are dealing with different kinds of lipoproteins. But in that, we are looking at a variant called as Apo B, EC. This is actually belonging to a group of E, cytidin, deaminase group of enzymes cited in deaminase group of enzymes and all of us are dependent on this apo b ec 3g for one purpose and that purpose is to have innate anti retro viral action what does this mean See, you might have heard of apoprotein B, apoprotein A, etc. at the superficial level. Some of you would have gone deeper also. But now I'm taking you even into the deepest forms of understanding apoproteins. Their biochemical relation, which has immunological function, that reflects as microbiological activity, which can be turned and intervened with the help of pharmacotherapy. So, apo B, EC3G belongs to a group of enzymes called as cytidin deaminase activity. Now, this requires some kind of molecular biology, which belongs to both biochemistry and immunology. Now, I'll erase what I have written here. What is meant by cytidin deaminase? Cytidin deaminase. Here, we have cytidin, which is a nucleoside or a tide, depending upon the phosphates. Cytidin triphosphate is called as CTP, which is a nucleotide. Even cytidin monophosphate is a nucleotide. Cytidin is a nucleoside. It contains cytosin plus ribose. Cytosin plus ribose is present in cytidin activity. Now, if I am going to draw a DNA like this, in that DNA, I'll be having A, T, C, G, A, 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 T, 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 C, G, etc. Right? In that, I'm focusing only on the C part. Now, come to the concept of virology. In virology, you have a special virus called as retrovirus. Examples, lentiviruses. One of the parts of lentivirus family would be HIV. In lentivirus family, lentiviridae, you have HIV. What kind of virus is HIV? HIV is a 
single stranded single stranded rna virus which has two pieces you'll be having pieces like this some students will think that because there are two pieces it should be double stranded remember when will you call the word double stranded if one strand is the exact complementary of the other strand only then you can call it as double stranded rna but here this strand and this strand were belonging to the same bigger strand i broke it here this is a smaller version of the strand this is a smaller version of the strand so there are two pieces of the same single strand of the rna now this hiv rna how does it replicate in your body i'll move forward the hiv as it enters into the body will give you the rna now the hiv also has another enzyme called as rna dependent dna polymerase can you tell me what is the simple name of this enzyme i know you all know just tell me what is the simple name of this enzyme the rna dependent dna polymerase it is retroviral polymerase okay i'll tell you the answer it is reverse transcriptase with the help of this rna dependent dna polymerase what went inside the virus was or uh, what went into the cell was rna by using this rna i am producing a dna now remember what is the difference between rna and dna one is the sugar called as ribose you will be having the sugar ribose in the rna you will be having the sugar deoxy ribose in the dna while in case of rna you will be having adenine and you will be having uracil you will be having cytosine and you will be having guanine you have au cg in case of dna you will be having at cg so in case of rna you will be having uracil in case of dna you will be having thymine in case of rna and dna both can have cytosine and cytidin now what is the group of enzymes i told you we are speaking about apo b e c 3 g belonging to the e cytidin deaminase family is what i was telling you now you have to be even more sharper while you're listening right now because this will open up the vistas for multiple different kinds of mcqs based on this topic this is a hot topic right now because multiple research have been done you will be getting a question in the need 2021 if the trend is the same there is a possibility of getting this question in aims and jitmer also but if you do not understand what this is then it becomes difficult for you at any given point of time you have the rights to stop me and ask me to repeat if you want me to repeat something so my point is in rna you'll be having au and cg in dna you'll be having at and cg i spoke about the apo ec3g which is actually a type of cytidin deaminase activity i am telling you what is the purpose in a hiv infection when a hiv virus comes inside your body will try to have the basic immune response what is that you will go for cytidin deamination if the rna by itself is attacked for example i have a u c g or a u g g here the cytidin deaminase will have its action on the single strand of the rna itself that is it is acting at the level of rna rna cytidin deaminase would mean to say that this cytidin on deamination will become uracil why because cytosin plus one more amino group will convert the cytosin into a new kind of base called as uracil so that would mean to say that a u c g will be converted into a u u g in the rna strand itself if that particular enzyme is not acting on the rna it is acting on the dna what happens if i have a t c g that becomes a t u g but u is unstable for the dna it won't be incorporated now what happens if it was rna a u u g what is the complementary dna formed from the rna against a i'll be having a t against u i'll be having c u and c are the same right so for the u or c i'll be having a g at this point of time so if i alter the cytidine into something else the dna that is formed will also be altered if this dna is altered dna then the counterpart dna that is coming out of it and the other kind of daughter rna coming out of it will be defective dna product or 
RNA product. This is what I want you to understand. I'm erasing all these things. I'll put all these things in one single line. Remember, when the HIV's RNA comes inside, the RNA can have its own nucleotide sequence. From the RNA, it has to give rise to a plus DNA. From the plus DNA, either I can produce a minus DNA or I can produce the original RNA meant for the HIV. So millions of copies of RNA can be formed and all the RNAs can actually become a part of the new daughter virions. So every daughter virion should have the perfect replication of the original RNA. But when I have APO B EC3G, which will have cytidine DMNA's activity, it will alter all the cytidine residues present in the RNA or in the DNA. When the cytidine is converted into uracil, when cytidine becomes uracil, against which if some kind of T of the opposite strain has to form, look at it, I will be always having A binding with T, T binding with A. I will have C binding with G or G binding with C. Now in the place of C, if I have U, then U is actually the replacement for thymine against which A can be formed. So in a place where G is supposed to be present, if A is present, I get a wrong kind of strain. When I get a wrong kind of strain, you will have a defective HIV replication. And defective HIV replication would mean to say that the HIV can't replicate properly. If the HIV can't replicate properly, I have a very weak virion. So you can go for abortive infection. Now we'll go to the question here. Look at the question here. <laughs> Among the following, which one belongs to the family of proteins that has been suggested to play an important role in the innate antiviral immunity? APOBEC3G is something who will act as a particular enzyme which will break the cytidine and convert it into uracil. That is, it has cytidine DMNA's activity. Once it has it, the HIV RNA will be altered. The DNA coming out of HIV RNA will also be altered. And ultimately, the parent is not giving rise to a proper virion. So all the other virions are weak virions. The patient may escape from AIDS. He might be having HIV, but he won't go for AIDS. I'll repeat this. With the effect of, ultimate last line, with the effect of APOB's CEC3G HIV will not progress to become AIDS. Now this has happened for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now it means to say that if your body's innate immune system is like this way, HIV would have also come across some kind of mechanism to counter the effect of APOEC3G. Now mark my word, there is an enzyme called as, or the gene called as VAF gene. This VAF gene will give rise to an enzyme. That enzyme is a protease and that protease will act on a protein. And that protein is APOEC3G. So the HIV, if it has VIF, that VIF will counter the APOEC3G by breaking it. If it is broken down, then HIV replication comes back to normal. HIV replication comes back to normal. So what are the different kinds of things that you learn for this one MCQ? To answer this one MCQ, first you have to know the function of APOE. Then you have to know the function of APOE. APOH is actually the wrong name. It's a misnomer. It is called as beta 2 GP1. This does not have much of a role to play right now here. It is actually having a function. I'll write it down here. APOH has anticoagulation action. I'll write it here. APOH has anticoagulation action. But in some other conditions, in abnormal conditions, it can also have coagulation action. This is unique for it. And if APOH comes into the question paper, you have to know something from hematology also. You have to know something from hematology also. So APOH is a misnomer. It is right now referred to as beta 2 G1 or beta 2 GP. Technically, it is based on agglutination reactions, coagulation reactions, anticoagulation reactions. So what is the point here? When there is a mutation in the APOH, or that is referred to as APO beta 2 GP, you can expect diseases like systemic lupus erythematosus, which presents with anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome. What does this lead to? This can lead to recurrent abortions in a female. Whenever there are recurrent abortions, one thing you have to notice or ask for would be antiphospholipid antibodies levels. So the patients with SLE can actually also have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. From there, you can have recurrent abortions. Now, this is the function of APO beta 2 GP. It is not B2, it is beta 2 GP APOH. Also remember, 
if the patient APOH is having a mutation, he can have coagulopathy also. And both of these are related to hematology of pathology, but they are not related to the immunology section right away here. Now, the one that is related to the hematology immunology would be APO BE C3G. And why? It has a cytidine deaminase activity. So, simple words APO B E C 3 G fights against virus. Which virus is important? HIV. So, this HIV can be broken by the APO E3. Now, HIV is going for an evolutionary change. It produces VIF. Now, this VIF will actually lead to the breakdown of APO B. So, micro ke liye kisko follow kare aapke lectures ya Preeti Sharma ma'am ke? If you ask me these kind of questions, how can I answer you? I can just tell you one thing. If you follow my lectures, I will be giving you deep knowledges. My concept is that go as deep as possible, go as wide as possible, load yourself with as much amount of information that no question appears very difficult for you. I have not seen Dr. Preeti Sharma's lectures, but if you think her lectures are better than mine, you're always welcome to look at her lectures and go for her lectures. If you think my lectures are okay with you, you can follow my lectures. Ultimately, all faculty are trying to give their best to you. My best is in such a way to help you understand a single question in all possible ways. Nobody can ask you a question which you can't answer. So, welcome. You're welcome if you wish to come for my lectures. So, I'm just giving a gist. I'm summarizing what I was speaking all the while. APO B E C 3 G is an enzyme. It's a protein. It comes from an APO B based genes. That enzyme fights HIV by causing changes in the HIV DNA and RNA. That is actually you're saying quality is better than quantity. If you think my quality is better, please follow. If you think her quality is better, please follow. I'm not giving you a diplomatic answer. Why? Because when you become a faculty, you will realize that there are other faculty also who are giving their best. So when a student says that you are bad and she is good, she is bad and you are good, it actually hurts someone or the other. So I do not want to hurt anyone. I believe that if you are my student, I'll be very happy if you're actually answering a question better. Thank you very much. Preeti Sharma ma'am is best. Yes, thank you very much, Rajesh Sharma. I am happy that you actually have respect for some teachers. Thank you. Okay. APO B E C 3 G is the enzyme which can fight HIV's virus. HIV will bring out a factor called as VIF, which will attack the APO B E C 3 G because of which you can nullify. Now, what happens? Because the your innate immune system has been knocked off by the VIF coming from HIV, then you can produce a therapeutic drug which is anti-VIF. If you block the VIF by giving a drug, that VIF will not be able to block the APOE. This APOB will be able to carry on with the cytidine DNA activity. Then HIV virus can be dealt with. So we'll come back to the MCQ here. Among the following, which one belongs to the family of proteins that has been suggested to play an important role in innate antiviral immunity? APOB EC3G is the answer. APOE epsilon 2 is about cholesterol transport in the brain, which is involved in Alzheimer's disease and atherosclerosis. APOH is related to the anticoagulation disorders and antiphospholipid syndrome. APOA is based on the exchange of lipoproteins between that of Minakshi <laughs> syndrome, sir, is the best. You'll know it when you attend classes. Thank you. Providing great information, sir. Yes, thank you very much. So here, APO BE C3G is for antiviral activity and immunity. APO E is for cholesterol transport in the brain, which can lead to Alzheimer's disease if it is disordered. APO H is for antiphospholipid syndrome. APO A is for normal levels of LDL, HDL. So I hope you will get the answer this way. So look at this. Just treat this question as if this is the question you get in the NEAT exam. You go to the NEAT exam, you see this question. So how will you approach this? First, you look at the APO values. You see it is a biochemistry question. Then you look at antiviral. You do not know how to link the biochemistry part with the antiviral activity. So this is just one step. I am not claiming to have taught you everything in immunology and biochemistry and microbiology. I am just showing you one step. If you understand the meaning of the APO proteins is not only with biochemistry, it also has an encompassing of role in all the other areas. These kind of questions will become easy for you. So in the fur, you can actually look for these questions easily. So if you have any kind of questions like these, you can mail me. I will reply you as number of times as possible. So now do you have any questions that I, I should answer you for?
if you have any questions i would like to answer them oh rajesh sharma sir aapki shakal balu se milti hai i am not a person coming from delhi or i am not a north indian so you are saying that my face looks like an elephant's face so this is purely the answer that the kind of student should not be giving but if you are saying my face looks like an elephant i am thankful that you have this opinion on me because this is a platform where we are discussing about microbiology and thank you for discussing about my face i'm really sorry i have been born ugly and if i'm ugly the way that you think i'm sorry that i have born this way and if you want me to not exist anymore i just have to survive right that's why i'm existing so i'm sorry my face came on your youtube face for the people who are not actually so happy with my classes i'm really sorry for that also but those people who have any questions you can ask me further okay so how can i give you any other kind of inputs right now one input i can give you is first look at the question then look at the options the more you look at the options see how every single option fares with the question here the most important part of the question is the concept called as antiviral the next is about next is about immunity so in case of immunity you're focusing on the immunological section okay now what are the points to favor in case of immunity look at this there are something called as defensins there are something called as lysozymes lysozymes and defensins are innate immunity at this point of time i will actually fare with one single extra mcq if you're okay with if you're okay with one mcq can you can i discuss one more mcq with you if you're okay with that just please put a thumbs up if you want to listen to one more mcq can you just put a thumbs up if you want me to discuss one more mcq yes now have a look at this class now have a look at this question just have a look at this question this is a severe upper extremity burn infected with yes rajesh sharma balu means bear not elephant yes i look like a bear thank you very much for your compliment and even if it's an insult yes i am ready to accept your insult thank you if teaching things for free is the reason that you are doing this to me i will accept it gracefully because you are also a student you have sit with me if you don't like my class also you have all the rights to hate my classes please put a thumbs down if you don't hate my class also thank you very much for your opinion a severe upper extremity burn infected with now look at this question here name the most common infection involved in the previous picture can you tell me name the most common infection involved in this previous picture this is severe upper extremity burn infected with name the most common infection involved in the previous picture give me any answer that you can say aithya tk is saying staff piyush raghwal says sir please can more of these kind discussions be made available yes i'll be coming five times on youtube every month so this is the second session we still have three more sessions uh one such session will come on monday that is tomorrow at 7:30 pm the next session will be at 8 pm on tuesday if you think that my classes are worth it please be available online so that i can discuss some more mcqs with you i'll always discuss a very complicated mcq and try to break it as simple as possible but if you want simple mcqs also to be done tell me i'll do that also 
Okay, Streptococcus pyogenes, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus aureus, B, C. So, some people are saying Staph aureus, some people are saying Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Very good. So, now you have given me very good answers to focus on. Focus here. Mm, I'll use this. Look at it. If I ask you, among... This session is for 20 minutes. Now, it has gone past 40 minutes. So, just be with me. I'll finish it right now. Streptococcus... Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas. Among the three organisms, which one is the most virulent? See, I'm asking you, okay, take this as one, take this as two, take this as three. Among these three organisms, tell me which one is the most virulent. IFRTK is saying, if it is hospital acquired, then it is Pseudomonas. Okay, that's a good answer. I just want you to think about it. The answer, I'm asking you, among these three, which one is very virulent? Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, Pseudomonas. You're saying Staph, some are saying Pseudomonas. Streptococcus, Pseudomonas. Okay, now I want you to understand one thing. Virulence is not just based on one factor. See, when you go for microbiology as such, Many times the question can look very simple to you. You give an answer. You come outside, the question and the answer is completely different. Now look at this. If you do not know why you chose the answer, that also is a failure on the part of MCQ. If you know why you chose the answer, but the question's answer key is different, that is also a failure on your part to score your marks for the exams. So the reason is that when we do not understand the real meaning of the words, it becomes difficult for us. What is virulence? I'll tell you in simple forms. Any factor that helps the organism to establish residence inside the host cell, because of which the organism can become persistent inside the host cell, because of which the organism can increase the frequency and severity of the natural course of disease and also the complications which may or may not lead to death that is called as virulence. The virulence can stem out of two things. One is the morphology of the organism. The second is, one is the morphology of the organism. Second is the toxins coming out of the organism. The third is about the drug resistance shown by the organism. So every time we speak about virulence, we have to take three things into consideration. One is the morphology of the organism. Second is the toxin. Third is the drug resistance. For example, if we speak about Staphylococcus, it's the king of all other kinds of highly virulent bacteria. Those fellows who said Staphylococcus, take a bow, you are right. Why? Because Staphylococcus ticks every single box. It is drug resistant, multi-drug resistant. It is sharper, it is invasive. It has a lot of toxins, totally 32 exotoxins come out of Staphylococcus, so it's the king of all kinds of toxins. Now look at Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, the point is, it is weakly invasive. From the point of view of morphology, it's not a highly strong organism in terms of invasiveness, but it is toxic. Though it is not capable of releasing 32 toxin, it can easily bar for 20 different kinds of exotoxins. But in case of drug resistance, Pseudomonas is more drug resistant than that of Staphylococcus aureus. So now your question and the answer should match these two. When it comes to Streptococcus, Streptococcus is like a child stuck between Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas. Streptococcus morphologically is a tough organism. It is a very invasive organism. But in case of exotoxins, it is not as toxic as Staphylococcus. It is slightly comparable that are pseudomonas but in case of drug resistance it is not as drug resistant as staphylococcus and pseudomonas so i'm going to erase this part i'll write it in simple words in case of staph highly invasive yes in case of staph exotoxins maximum yes next is you look for drug resistance maximum now look for streptococcus Invasiveness is okay compared with the staphylococcus. Exotoxins, moderate. Drug resistance, minimal. You come to pseudomonas. Invasiveness, absolutely nil. These two are invasive. Pseudomonas is non-invasive. When it comes to exotoxins, it is on par with that of staphylococcus, though the numbers are lesser. It is highly drug resistant. The most drug resistant organism is pseudomonas. Now, come back to the picture here I showed you. Look at the picture here. This is a Burns infection. If they ask you, what is the most common organism causing Burns infection? Your most common answer would be Pseudomonas. I'm very sure you'll say Pseudomonas. Now I want you to revisit the statement. Look at this. 
in the board. See, if this is a burnt skin. If this is a normal skin, I place a staff here, I place a pseudomonas here. Both of them are placed here. Pseudomonas will be a failure. Pseudomonas is a coward. It cannot penetrate a normal intact skin. Only when the skin is already burnt in a compromised skin, Pseudomonas can penetrate. Pseudomonas is weakly invasive, so it can't burn through the skin. But Staphylococcus is deeply invasive. It can penetrate through the most toughest organ of your body called a skin. So in terms of invasiveness, Staph can easily cause skin infections compared to Pseudomonas in a non-burnt area. Now look at the burnt area. In the burnt area, if I throw one staff here, one pseudomonas here, pseudomonas binds to the burnt area a thousand times with more affinity than that of staff. Pseudomonas binds to the burnt area with thousand times more affinity than that of staff. But if I put my burnt skin into the atmospheric air and I expect many antigens to come and hit me and many infections to come and hit me, remember in the atmospheric air, staff will always trump pseudomonas so there are many papers who say staphylococcus aureus can easily cause burn infections on the you with that of pseudomonas so now i'll come to the answer here look at this in the name the most common infection involved in the previous picture in terms of ability to cause burns infection pseudomonas is number one in terms of frequency to cause burns infection, Staphylococcus is the answer. So if this is a PJ Chandigarh question, go for both Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus aureus. But if it's a PJ Chandigarh question, among burns infection in the burns wards, the answer would be Pseudomonas. Now I hope you got your explanation. If there is any other question that you wish to ask me, you can ask me now. Are you okay with this answer? Please put a thumbs up if you are okay with the answer. You are saying nosocomial. Excellent answer. See, MRSA, LRSA. What does it mean? Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Lenazolid resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It means Staphylococcus aureus is more nosocomial than any organism. Pseudomonas and Staphylococcus will both equally matching each other in case of nosocomial infection. But when it comes to burn skin, Pseudomonas will be having more affinity to the burn skin, while Staphylococcus will have more frequency to the burn skin. If you ask, Ian Pranati is asking me, but for this question, what would be the single best answer? Your textbook information, if you follow, the most common infection involved in the previous picture would be Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Because as the person said somewhere, the Pseudomonas is more commonly available in the burns wards because Pseudomonas is low lying. But Staphylococcus aureus comes through nose. So for those in case of hospitals, because we are properly using all the hand washing techniques, I'm giving you the reason why you're saying that. Sir, if you have to say one answer, then what is the answer? That is what I'm telling you. Look at this. In the hospitals, we can go for proper aseptic precautions and hand washing techniques. And in the previous free session we discussed, the hand washing techniques are the best to deal with Staphylococcus aureus. So a doctor or a nurse, most of the healthcare professionals are capable of performing their proper hand washing techniques. So the hand washing techniques can block the Staphylococcus aureus, but hand washing techniques cannot block Pseudomonas. That is why Pseudomonas can trump Staphylococcus aureus. The most Affinity to the burns infection is Staphylococcus, but the most, I mean, the most strongest affinity to the burns is Pseudomonas. The most common would be Staphylococcus aureus. But in hospital setup, again, it can be Pseudomonas than that of Staph aureus because in the hospital setup, Staph aureus can be controlled by hand washing techniques, but not Pseudomonas. Okay, so parting words, I'll just tell you a few things before you leave. Right now, you might be preparing for entrance exams or you might be re-preparing for entrance exams or you are in your third year or second year of MBBS exams, you want to learn microbiology well. No matter what it is, your friends may leave you. Your enemies may actually put you down. The backstabbers will always stab. The only kind of friend that you can ever have and trust is yourself. If you trust yourself, you can back yourself up and you are the best companion you will have for the rest of your lives. And that would mean to say that keep yourself as entertaining as possible. Also, in the exam hall, you can't actually copy these days. So the only person who should help you will be you. So load your information, load the brain with enough amount of information. Keep yourself happy. Every single time you learn something new, 
please be happy that you're learning something new and every time you learn something new do not stop if you learn something try to use this information on something else because when i go into a class and i call a student brilliant i go to the same class i call the same student intelligent calling somebody intelligent is always better than calling somebody as brilliant brilliant means reflection if i throw in 10 data to you you give me back all the 10 data you are a brilliant student but i give you 10 data you might be lazy but out of all the 10 data you heard about only one datum and you use that one datum in thousand different questions that is where you are an intelligent student but in entrance exams what is required is it brilliance or intelligence you can never say or there is no option you have to be both you have to be brilliant load yourself with information you have to be intelligent use the information all the questions and when that happens nobody can stop you from being a winner and if you have been my student at some point of time i really pray to god that you will be successful you may not remember what i teach you you may not remember me by myself but you will remember the field of medicine will always feed you enough so you will never go hungry when medicine is on your side you'll never go loss your life will never be a failure if you're a doctor so being a doctor is one of the greatest professions in the world the noblest of professions so please be proud of it learn something every single day make yourself a better person thank you for being there with me thanks a lot for listening to me and thanks a lot for all your comments have a good day bye